Good morning. It is uh, a joy to be with you this morning. For those who uh, may not have been here or don't remember me, my name is Nick. Uh, I know Eric introduced me, but I just wanted to uh, introduce myself again, just to tell you how uh, grateful I am to be here, how big of a joy it is for me to be with God's people and hear um, God's praises, just uh, bouncing off the ceiling and just filling this space. It's, uh, it's a great joy to be with you this morning. And uh, it, it's a great joy just to, to hear the songs sung, um, even in the Trinity hymnal here, the song number 55, we just sang, His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. It's just such a joy to be together and just such a picture of how we're going to spend eternity. And so it's just exciting to be here, and I'm thankful, and I just want to express that myself. Please open your Bible this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 1. The text that Eric read for us is our text this morning. And uh, I bring greetings from my family. My wife uh, and I just had our second daughter, so that's why she's not with us this morning. An hour and a half car ride is a little bit uh, a little bit too much for a 10-day-old uh, baby girl, but um, they do wish they could be here. They might even be tuning in online. But uh, anyways, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll focus on verses 3 through 14, but I'll read starting from verse 1. Let me read our text and pray, and then we'll continue to worship through the word. Paul. An apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love. And self control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, you know my weakness. You know our weakness. And we pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on us, that you would pour out your grace, that you would help, that you would help us to hear and help me to preach, Lord, and that your word would have its full effect on us this morning. Lord, that it would strengthen us, that it would strengthen us to live faithfully in times of difficulty. Lord, I pray that it would be a help to my brothers and sisters here this morning, that you would use it to to build up this church, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your many promises and all of the grace we already experience in Christ. We just pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to live it out this morning, to have ears to hear, 
Lord, that you would help me to speak clearly. Lord, I pray for your help. We pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. What was it when you were a child that your parents had to remind you about day after day? Or if you're raising children, what is it that you have to remind your children about day after day? Was it the classic to feed the dog you promised to take care of? Was it to clean your room? Or was it to close the door so the heat doesn't get out in the winter? Why is that such a common experience? Why do we need so many reminders? And why, when we're young, do we feel the same way about it as everyone else? The older I get, the more reminders I need. And the more welcome these reminders seem to be. Now I depend on reminders for almost everything. I keep a schedule on my phone, which gives me reminders. I depend on reminders from my wife to remember people's names or to know what to pick up from the grocery store on the way home from the office. And I'm sure you could probably add a few of your own needs for reminders to that list. I think our response to reminders changes as we age and we see them as a welcome gift because we start to, we start to realize just how much help we actually need to remember how to live life faithfully. Life gets busy, schedules get full, and we start to forget things. The urgent can displace the important, and what's right can be displaced by what works. We start to drift in what we pay attention to. We start to put out fires. We start to clean up messes instead of paying attention to what we ought to be doing. And so as we start to realize our weaknesses and our tendencies to drift, reminders become very helpful and exactly what we need. This kind of pragmatism, the mindset which says what works is what's right, is a temptation to all of us. And it's a common snare. As life gets busier and schedules get full, we tend to drift from what we actually want to do, from what we've been told to do. And no one drifts into adulthood. No one drifts into a good marriage. No one drifts into responsibility. And certainly the same is true for the church. No one drifts into faithfulness in ministry. This pragmatism, this tyranny of the urgent, this under uh, this attempt to do what works instead of what we know is what's called for and what's right can often uh, influence or even govern our ministries. If we're not careful, we can fall to this influence. It's so strong. So we need reminders. And we need to welcome reminders as truly helpful. The New Testament takes the same approach to reminders. It's full of them. In Paul's second, Timoth- second letter to Timothy proves that the same temptations, the same struggles, the same drifting is common to Timothy as it is to us. And Paul writes reminder after reminder after reminder to teach him what it means to be faithful, to remind him what it means to be faithful, not just to drift towards what works, not just to put out pastoral fires, but to do what he's faithfully called to do. The apostle is writing from prison. He's awaiting execution, and he writes to his apprentice, his son in the faith, reminding him about faithfulness in ministry. This is the last letter we have from Paul. So it expresses his dying concern for Timothy. And as a loving father, Paul reminds him of three components of faithful ministry. Not just what works and not just what's convenient, but three components of faithfulness for ministry. The first we'll see this morning is Paul reminds Timothy to make full use of his gifts. And second, we'll see Paul reminds Timothy to share in suffering for the gospel. And third, Paul reminds Timothy to guard the good deposit. To make full use of his gifts, to share in suffering, and to guard the good deposit. Okay, so first, from our text, Paul reminds Timothy of his responsibility to make full use of his gifts. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to unpack every statement in these opening verses, but we can't miss Paul's tone and heart 
Paul did not just open this letter with a strong-handed command. He's not a cold-hearted cult leader who orders his grunts around while he sits back in importance and luxury. Paul is in prison, and he's bursting with love and confidence in his son in the faith, the one he's appointed to take care of the church in Ephesus. So look with me at verses 3 through 5 and see his constant thankfulness for him in verse 3. Do you see that? He's constantly thanking God for him night and day. Do you see his love for him in verse 4? He longs to see him so that he may be filled with joy. And do you see his confidence in Timothy in verse 5? He's reminded of his sincere faith and he's sure that it dwells in him. And may the Lord bless all the Loises and Eunices of this church. May the next generation of Timothys come from your homes. The Lord sees and uses your labors. Be encouraged, sisters. And then we find our command, which comes in the form of a reminder. He reminds Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God. Look at verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Paul's metaphor here of fanning this flame is is less like getting a a campfire going after you let it burn out overnight. You know when you have a pile of white ash and you just kind of just kind of gently blow and you just start to look for those orange glowing ambers. It's not like that. Rather, it's like that time when you had a responsible fire going and you had a little bit of a reckless uh, streak in you and you found some wood pallets and perhaps last year's Christmas tree and just threw it on. Someone here knows what I'm talking about with that. Paul is not calling Timothy a smoldering wick. He's telling him to turn up the heat. He's telling him to add fuel to the fire, to burn brighter, to increase, to make full use of this gift. Now, from the mention of fear at the beginning of verse 7, many have concluded that Timothy likely had a trait of timidity. He was shy, perhaps. Or maybe he was tempted to fear man. And this fear was providing a temptation to scale back his ministry efforts or to even be ashamed of this message. It's important, again, to note the tone of this letter. Paul doesn't scold Timothy here. Paul's letter doesn't come in the context context of a calloused heart. He's not stern. He's not worn down by the trials of life and taking it out on his son. No. To overcome fear, he encourages him to make full use of his gifts in love and in confidence in reliance on the Holy Spirit. Timothy struggles with fear, whether those fears were external or came up internally, they, Paul knew that those had the, had the power to make him drift, to make him pull back from what he's been called and ordained to do. He knows that Timothy doesn't have what it takes on his own. And if Timothy looks inward, fear and self-preservation could hijack his entire ministry. And Paul does not want that. So while Paul is confident Paul is confident in the sincerity of Timothy's faith. He's not basing his confidence on Timothy himself. Rather, he's basing it on this Holy Spirit. Did you see that in verse 7? For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Timothy is not to rely on himself or even his gifts, but on the Spirit who uses his gifts to bless the church. To build up the church. And we don't have time to dive into each of these attributes, but isn't it exactly what a fearful, insufficient minister needs? He needs God's Spirit who gives him power and love and self control to press in when he's tempted to pull back. John Stott says here since he is the Spirit of power, we may be confident of his enabling as we exercise our ministry. Since he is the spirit of love, we must use God's authority and power in serving others, not in self-assertion or vain glory. And since he is the spirit of self-control, we must use them with seemly reverence and restraint. Now, you might be wondering, 
So what is this gift that he's supposed to fan into flame? We know it, it's associated here with the laying on of Paul's hands. And so I want to suggest that it's his preaching gifts and ministry. I'm making that connection with the rest of the letter in mind as well as 1 Timothy 4. Maybe you want to jot that reference down and, and look at that later. Paul's mention here of laying on of hands makes it seem like it's his ordination for ministry. But since it's not explicitly mentioned here, we can be satisfied to just keep our focus on Paul's concern that Timothy make full use of his gifts, whatever they are. And the New Testament has this vision for all believers. It's not just for preachers. Consider Peter's words in 1 Peter 4, 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Like Peter, like Paul, Peter knew God's people needed reminders to use their gifts in ways that reflect God's glory. One of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life is seeing my wife worship. We'll be just sitting there in a normal worship song, service. A certain song will be sung. Then, as my wife and I are standing side by side, usually holding hands, something like that, I feel her let go. And she just raises her hands in worship. She's just not thinking about me anymore. Her eyes might be open, they might be closed. She's just swelling with love for the Lord. And it just brings it to that next level. And I find it more and more beautiful as we get a little bit older. As we get older, we face more trials, we have more scars. We share more and more in one another's ups and downs, encouragements and discouragements. It's simply amazing to see the love for the Lord in her heart get turned up to 10 during worship. Now, I know in some churches, raising your hands in worship is a little bit more foreign. For some churches, that's pretty mild. But that's not my point here. My point is not to address what's permissible in worship at this point, what to do with your hands in worship. It's just to address that seeing my bride's heart swell with love for her Savior is beautiful. And isn't it that way when we see Christ's bride, her heart swell with love for her Savior? When her love gets turned up for ten, the whole church, where the Lord reinvigorates His people and revives their love. He revives the sleepy Christians among them to love the Lord their God with all of their heart and all of their mind and all of their strength and all of their soul. Isn't it beautiful when we see that? Imagine a church where it's not the pastors, it's not the missionaries, it's not the professionals, or it's not the new believers who are fired up to love the Lord their God with all of their being. Imagine when everyone is sold out and fully engaged. Imagine the beauty, imagine the glory reflected in our hearts being swollen with love for our Savior. Imagine that church. You see... It's right to love the Lord your God with the dials of your heart turned up to 10. Of course, this is more than just singing. You can be burning with affection for Christ and sing softly in your seat in the fear of the Lord or quietly be in prayer or serve silently where no one's looking. It's not about being loud. That's not the point. Brothers and sisters, being fully engaged in worship is fitting for the God we worship. Fear, cowardice, laziness, half-heartedness, those are not. Those don't fit. They don't match the God we serve. They don't match the salvation we've been given. To worship half-heartedly is, a, is not fitting for our King, for who He is. And the same is true for all of life and ministry, is it not? And I'm not using ministry here to refer to a vocation. I'm using it to refer to the fact that every member in Christ's church has been given a gift to minister in the body. So just as Paul reminded Timothy to do, we need to intentionally fan into flame the gift of God given to each one of us. It's not reserved just for the preachers. The Lord knows that life is difficult 
and weariness can set in and love can grow cold. The fires can die down in our love and our service. So we need to appreciate this reminder and take it seriously. So then how do we respond? Well, Paul gave Timothy the application and the motivation for this command in the following section. And we'll get there momentarily. Timothy was to boldly declare the gospel and not defect from his loyalty to Christ or Paul. So, if you've been gifted to teach in the church, there it is, loud and clear, right there for you, spelled out. You are not to pull back out of fear or shame or weariness. No, if you have been gifted to teach and preach like Timothy, you are responsible to make full use of your gifts for ministry, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And can I just say, what could be more needed in our confused and divided world than faithful men faithfully proclaiming God's word in such a way that calls the whole church to the unity of the faith? What could be more needed? But not everyone is gifted to teach and preach, right? So how does someone with gifts of service apply this command? If that's you, then whatever gift you've been given, make full use of it. Fan it into flame. This applies to everything from working the sound booth to visiting shut-ins, from preaching on the street corner or praying with someone over the phone. And perhaps you're gifted in hospitality. Maybe you love having people over but you're tired of always inviting people over and never getting an invitation back. Perhaps some bitterness or resentment has taken root in your heart in what feels like one-way relationships. And now you only invite your close friends over. And you don't want to invite them too many times in a row lest you always be the host and it kind of turn into one of those things again. So you guard yourself. You kind of pull back. Brother or sister, if that's you, can I encourage you? to put off resentment or bitterness by taking a fresh look at your Savior. Remember that it is your Savior who has given you that gift to minister to His people and to bless His church. And your reward for doing so is far greater than an invitation to lunch somewhere. Your gift of hospitality is desperately needed in this church. After 18 distressing months of isolation and confusion, there are few things more comforting than an open door and a hot cup of coffee. Few things have the keeping power in a believer's life, like a home-cooked meal and, dare I say, a hug. Brothers and sisters, the New Testament vision for the church is that everyone be fully engaged. Everyone, use the gifts God has given you. And yet, as J. Adams says, God's gifts do not work automatically. They must be kindled. And when you have allowed them to burn low, they must be rekindled again. So ask yourself, have I pulled back from using my gifts? Will you resolve today to turn from that? To make full use of your gifts for ministry to bless this church. Not only does Paul remind Timothy to make full use of his gifts, but he also reminds him of a second component for faithful ministry, one that we can drift from, one that we might avoid, and that's to share in suffering. Look with me at verse 8. Paul writes, Therefore, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. So, Paul, having reminded Timothy to stir up his gifts, to use them fully, whether those fears come from outside or inside, he's supposed to use them in fearful situations. Paul knows that engaging in ministry will mean that he's going to face the same opposition Paul himself had. I mean, Paul's writing from prison. He knows the end result of the gospel ministry. In fact, the temptation 
here that he knows Timothy will face is to pull back, to give up, to be ashamed of the gospel or of Paul himself, like many others have. If you continue to read this book, you'll see it everywhere. He'll settle, he'll, he'll be tempted to settle for ease or for comfort. It's not unique to pastors. It's common to all Christians. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that we will all face persecution. So Paul reminds Timothy that he must not defect from his loyalties in ministry. His loyalties to Christ or his loyalties to Paul. Paul and Timothy both know that his message is not a popular one. Timothy might be tempted to tweak his message, to adjust it so that he faces less opposition and has to face less suffering. But this temptation has led many astray in many different ways. And like we saw in the previous point, Paul Paul tells Timothy to do this by the power of God. It takes the power of God to press in when you're tempted to pull back. And Christian, I don't want you to miss what happens next. Paul does what Paul does best. He doesn't just give Timothy trite phrases of Christianese to get him through his real trials. He preaches the gospel to him. He reminds him of the power of God at work in his life. Isn't that what you need when you're suffering? When you're wondering, where is God at work here? Where is the power of God to help me? Paul knows that's exactly what we think. And so he reminds him. In verses 9 and 10, Paul wields nearly nearly every element of the doctrine of salvation to remind Timothy of God's power at work through the gospel and for him. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me. God who saved us and called us to a holy calling... Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Maybe that was a lot. Maybe you're not following with me. Let's let's work through this phrase by phrase. Keep your eyes on the text for a minute. Paul writes, God saved us. Look at verse 9. Pointing out how God rescues us from his wrath. Then he says, God called us. Highlighting how God personally draws us to himself. And then he calls us to a holy calling. Reminding us of how our sanctification, our being set apart for life unto God, comes through the gospel. Next, Paul reminds Timothy that salvation is not because of works, but because of his purpose and grace, reminding Timothy that he contributed nothing to his salvation. Rather, it was God's free gift. And this grace is in Christ Jesus, which points us to our union with Christ, the doctrine that holds it all together, union with Christ through faith, means that all of Christ's accomplishments can be given to us freely. We can benefit from them because we are his covenant people. And when did this happen? Both before the ages began in the plan of God, our doctrine of election, and in real time, fulfillment and accomplishment of that plan by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you see that in verse 10? God the Father planned it, and God the Son accomplished it. Jesus' death abolishes death because he died our death. Jesus' resurrection brought life and immortality because being united with him by faith, we have been given new, regenerate, or resurrection hearts, and we have a guarantee of eternal life. God the Father planned it, God the Son accomplished it, and God the Spirit applies it in us, verse 10, through the gospel. The gospel is words, but words used by the Holy Spirit to grant eternal life. The Spirit given to us, we see in verse 7. The same Spirit that now dwells in us, verse 14. When we repent and believe the gospel, we are made alive by the Spirit. 
Brothers and sisters, entire books are devoted to each one of these elements of salvation. But Paul is able to sweetly and swiftly apply them to his fearful son in the faith. To this pastor tempted to pull back. Doctrine is not the enemy of a vibrant Christian life. It is the foundation of it. Paul's doctrine is not stale or boring. It is the bedrock from which we can actually face suffering. It's where we can see God is at work in all of these things to strengthen you, to walk into suffering and not pull back, to press into ministry to others in the church rather than pull back in self-preservation, to pull back from just doing what works or what's sufficient, but rather giving your all to one another. And this is the point. This is the point. It's in seeing God's power at love and love at work in Christ and for you in the gospel that you can be strengthened by God to suffer for the gospel. Let me say that again. It's in seeing God's power and love at work in Christ and for you in the gospel that you can be strengthened by God to share in suffering for the gospel. Friend, if you're here today and not a follower of Jesus, I want to talk to you for a second. I don't know you, you don't know me. This might be the first time you've ever heard this. This might be the first time you've ever been in church. Or maybe you can't remember a time not being in church, but you've never truly turned to Christ. If that's you... I want to tell you today that God is at work in the world to save sinners, but that won't make sense, and it certainly won't be sweet to you unless you realize that you have sinned against a holy God. That you are a sinner and that you're standing this close to death and judgment. That won't make sense to you. You might scoff at it. At any moment, the God who gave you life might require it back, and you will be found personally guilty for all the wrongs you've ever done. No amount of excuses or claims not to know that God exists or comparisons to other people will be sufficient for you on that day. They won't be sufficient to clear you. If you love yourself and your sin and are satisfied with it, you won't hear what I'm saying right now. You'll scoff at it. You'll think it's useless or something else. But if you're here this morning and you know that even if you had a fresh start, you'd mess it all up again, if you have no more excuses and you know you're guilty before God, then friend, you should really come to Jesus. The very one who you've sinned against died to save sinners just like you. Why don't you call out to him today for help? Right there in your seat. Right here, right now. And brothers and sisters, we need to see that Paul reminds Timothy of everything he has received in Christ to strengthen his resolve to stay faithful for Christ. We have to see that like a surgeon implanting steel in one's spine, Paul reminds Timothy of all of God's work from eternity past to eternity future for him in Christ to strengthen him to face the suffering of this life, the struggle of this life, to not be ashamed of Christ, and to not just suffer himself, but to share in suffering. Did you catch that word? I love that word. Share in suffering. Paul knew what it meant to be abandoned while suffering. And he's calling Timothy to share in it. So it might not be you personally who's suffering, but you're called and responsible to share in one another's suffering. To not pull back when someone's suffering, but to press in, in love. Likewise, we must remember the gospel if we're not going to pull back. The gospel was Paul's confidence. God's power at work through it was his confidence. Look at verse 12. He knew God was guarding him, which enabled him to press on. And this reminder to share in suffering comes from that place of security with God that's given in the gospel. And it reminds me of Hebrews 10 where we see this lived out in the believers there who are being persecuted and thrown into prison. The author there writes in verse 32, but recall the former days when, 
After you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession, an abiding one. It's like a situation I heard of recently. I was on a call with a missionary in Asia in a closed country, and he spent about two, two decades in that place, and he said that they all knew that a new tide of persecution was coming because they, they, that, that happened every time there was an increased promotion of the ruling party's ideology. And I'll pray I never forget what he told me. He said that every church he knew of this year, 2021, this was in 2021, this year, every church he knew of had a meeting where an item on the agenda was who's going to take care of the pastor's family when he gets hauled off to jail. They knew it was coming. It's an item on their business meeting agenda. Imagine writing that agenda. Imagine putting that in the order. Imagine looking across the room and seeing the pastor's wife and kids sitting there while you discuss it. But also imagine the comfort that those families must have felt when their husbands and dads were being hauled off in handcuffs and they knew the church was going to share in their suffering. Imagine the comfort when the people there were prepared to not pull back out of self-preservation, but to press in and share in suffering. Though we don't face that situation in a widespread way here, we do face the perennial temptations to grow cold, to forget what Christ has done, and to pull back from sharing in one another's suffering. So we must honestly assess the threats associated with faithfulness to Christ and whether or not they're deterring us from being faithful to Christ. And at this point, let me just be clear and address the elephant in the room. This does apply to the church's response to the government in our day and age. But this isn't the only thing. This isn't simple. This isn't easy. It's not the only factor involved in these ethical decisions to obey and disobey the government. And since I'm not one of your pastors, I will leave that to them, and I'll ask you to pray for them and to try to make it easy for them to lead you in this. This reminder also extends beyond our present situation, beyond our government's restrictions. You might never be hauled off to jail like in other countries, but faithfulness to Christ could result in you suffering like losing your job. I was talking with a child educator recently whose workplace is looking to join in the trend of having dragged story time for kids. And she now has to think through what this, what this means for her, what this means to be faithful to, to Christ even if it costs her her job. And my family needs to prepare from across the table how we're going to enter into her suffering. Maybe it's taking a month's rent for her if she loses her job. Maybe it's buying the family groceries for a while. Whatever it is. It certainly means praying for them. It certainly means helping them to think through what faithfulness looks like in that situation. It's very real. You might not be held off to prison But there is a great amount of suffering for Christ to be shared. Brothers and sisters, if we are to be faithful in this, we must not be risk averse. We must not neglect our responsibility to one another. If preaching the gospel and faithfulness to Christ is risky, that must be a risk we are willing to take. We must not be ashamed of the Lord and those suffering for Him. And like our first point, I simply want to call you to share in one another's suffering by sharing hospitality to one another. I want to encourage you to open your home and care for one another. Hospitality is mainly about providing refreshment to both body and soul. You can invite a lonely single brother or sister over for dinner and have a conversation. You can put on the crock pot on Sunday morning and invite a family over for lunch. You could bring a meal to a family who's in trial. Or you could just send a text, send an email, pick up the phone and call them. Remind one another of the confidence you have in each other. 
Remind one another of your love for one another. Remind one another of how the gospel is at work in your life. Even if there's trials, even if there's suffering, and you're wondering, where is the power of God in this? This life is difficult. We need to keep an eye out for one another on how we can share one another's sufferings. We need one another. So brothers and sisters, there are many more applications to this, of course. But we will never take any of them. We'll never take any steps unless we prepare to share in one another's sufferings. Unless we value this reminder, we let it stir up our hearts so that we can act in faithfulness. Which brings us to our third reminder. Verses 13 and 14. We have our third reminder from Paul. Paul reminds Timothy to guard the good deposit. Look at verse 13 with me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Here we have back-to-back commands, and they work in a mutually informing way. Paul wants Timothy to hold on to the pattern of sound words and guard the good deposit. Those two commands, those two verbs are important to consider. The ESV, which I'm reading from, translates the first follow, but the NIV or the NASB, I think, do a better job translating it keep or retain the pattern of sound words. It's like when someone important asks you to pass along a message for them. It's not like when someone says, say, oh, say hi to Bob for me. It's more like when your boss tells you, tell Bob down the hall to get me his expense report by the end of the day. You need to hold on. You need to keep in mind what your boss has just told you to relay to Bob. You have to hold on here. You have to keep it. And so Timothy is to hold on to and guard the apostolic teaching. Here Paul calls it the pattern of sound words and the good deposit. These again are parallel phrases describing the same reality. And like I said, the pattern of sound words and good deposit, that's the apostolic teaching that Timothy heard from Paul. Timothy had known Paul for about 20 years by this point. He was with him. He heard him teach and preach. He was right there with him. And the apostolic teaching here, the sound Uh, The the sound words and good deposit, it's more than just the gospel, though it certainly includes the gospel. You'll recall with Jesus' words in the Great Commission, when he charged the twelve disciples to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. Do you remember Acts 2.42 which says the first church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It's what Jude 3 calls the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Or consider the motto from this church, from Acts 20, 27. Paul did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And Paul was Timothy's example to follow. So Timothy is to keep and guard to preach the word, just like Paul did. The good deposit is everything we have in this book. The inscripturated testimony, the inscripturated teaching of the apostles. We have it, and we're to hold it. We're to hold on. We are to guard it. They imply, these these verbs of keeping and guarding, they imply a possibility of a threat, do they not? We have to be aware of the threats. These are actually the same words of the job description of the Levitical priests. I don't know if you know that. Imagine a Levite standing guard at the tabernacle where the law has been deposited, the Ten Commandments in the ark. Like a guard standing outside of Buckingham Palace, except instead of one of those big black bushy hats, he's got a turban on his head. He's standing guard, right? He's protecting something. There's potential for threat. You see, in this world, people are always distorting the gospel, always distorting the apostolic teaching. Ever since the early church, there have been those who misunderstand or adjust or tweak the gospel of grace and empty it of its power 
and, and, and void it of, its, of, the, of the saving message it has. If we don't pay attention to these threats, we won't guard it properly. But there is also a threat from within. If we doubt the gospel, we might be tempted to adjust it, to make it more effective, to make it work. Or if we suffer from the gospel, we might hold back from preaching that more offensive bit. We might remove a part, say the part about sin, so that it's more palatable for people, so that we, don't, so that we can have a longer ministry, so that we can be more effective, so that we can reach more people. But we can't do that. We have to guard and keep the pattern of sound words. We cannot let a threat come from outside or inside. So in light of these same threats, Timothy must trust in the sufficiency of Scripture, the sufficiency of this word. He has to restrain himself from any temptation to adjust it, add to it, or take away from it. Paul reminded Timothy that his job is to guard it, not to innovate, not to make it more effective, not to develop, not to adjust or make it effective. Brothers and sisters, with these threats present, it makes sense why Paul's dying concern is to remind Timothy to guard the good deposit entrusted to him. And as recipients of this good deposit, we also have to hear this reminder and take it Seriously, we now share this responsibility, like Timothy. But how? How are we to guard the good deposit? I mean, it's just, it's here, isn't it? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to guard this? Does it mean put it, your Bible in a box or in a safe? No. How do we guard this? Well, first, I think you'll agree that the most immediate application is to pastors. Since Paul here is speaking to Timothy... Who's a local church pastor? So, brother pastor, I want to encourage you this morning to spend time meditating on the pastoral job description we find in this letter. Paul calls Timothy to handle the word rightly, to rely on the sufficiency of God's word. And then he charges him to preach the word knowing that it's sufficient not just for him, but for everybody. And then he calls him to train faithful men to follow in the pattern of the same ministry that Paul and now Timothy have. But say you're not a pastor. Most aren't. If you're a member of this church, you can guard the good deposit. You can do it by being a faithful member. Devote yourself to knowing this book. Study it and be enthralled with the God of the Word. Know Him and love Him. If you feel like you don't know what you're doing when you study the Bible on your own, feel free to come talk to me after this. I'd love to just talk to you briefly about basic steps in studying the Bible for yourself. There's no silly question. Everyone must learn in this area. So if that's you, feel free to come and talk to me or talk to the person next to you. They'll probably have a great amount of help for you. And third, if we are to keep and guard the good deposit in the church... And as a church, we must guard the purity of the church, which displays the gospel. And here I mean to draw attention to the all too often forgotten practice of church discipline. The Lord gave his church the means to remove members who persist in unrepentant sin and distort the gospel. Matthew 18 says that after repeated attempts and escalating calls for repentance, if members persist in sin, they are to be removed from the church and treated as unbelievers. Unbelievers who need love, unbelievers who need the gospel, unbelievers who need the church, but who the church can no longer affirm in their profession of faith because of their lack of repentance. Church discipline is important for maintaining the purity of the church, and we must guard it if we are going to guard the good deposit. This doesn't mean that sinners are not welcome. It doesn't mean that sinners are not loved. And this certainly doesn't mean we just become suspicious of one another. Certainly not. 
Like Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.13, we're to keep in guard with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. But we're not going to be more loving than God who tells us to do this. It does mean that if someone is unwilling to repent, after repeated attempts to call them to repentance, the church is to break fellowship with them. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul writes that it is an arrogant and dangerous thing to permit hypocrisy and unrepentant sin to linger in the church. We're doing no one a favor. Instead, as a people, we must reflect the purity of our Savior and our lives must reflect the reality of the gospel. Therefore, if we're going to guard the good deposit, we have to guard the purity of the church. And this includes church discipline. Saints of Trinity Baptist, it's a joy to be with you to bring this word about Paul's dying concern for Timothy, that he be reminded to remain faithful. He doesn't want fear, opposition, or difficulty to tempt him to drift to tempt him to be compromised or grow cold in pragmatism. Just doing what's easy or what's safe or what works. We need to hear this. Believers need to hear this. And so the same reminders apply to all of us. By the power of this Spirit, we too must make full use of our gifts for ministry. And by the Spirit, we must not be ashamed of the gospel the testimony of our Lord, or of those suffering for him. But we must press in and share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And by the Spirit, we must guard the good deposit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you have given us everything we need. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful. Help us to not drift from faithfulness, but to rely on you and the power of God in salvation and the very presence of the Spirit in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for your great help. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a hymn now from the Trinity Hymnal, number 83.